Radiocarbon and Dinosaur Fossils. That is the title of a, an article by Philip J. Center, just written this year, in the American Biology Teacher. The full title is Radiocarbon and Dinosaur Fossils, Compatibility with an Age of Millions of Years. Think about what that's saying. And again, this is available on the internet, so you can look at it all you want to. I have not completely reproduced it, and if you see green ellipses, those are places that I've omitted stuff. But you're welcome to go back to the original article and see if I've omitted anything really important. The abstract, and I'll just quote that completely, the recent discovery of radiocarbon in dinosaur bones at first seems incompatible with an age of millions of years due to the short half-life of radiocarbon. Let that sentence sink in. The recent discovery of radiocarbon in dinosaur bones is now being accepted as a fact. They're not fighting that it isn't really there. Continuing, however, evidence from isotopes other than radiocarbon show that dinosaur fossils are indeed millions of years old. So you, I suppose you'd believe them rather than the radiocarbon. Fossil bone incorporates new radiocarbon by means of recrystallization and in some cases bacterial activity and uranium decay. Because of this, bone mineral, fossil or otherwise, is a material that cannot yield an accurate radiocarbon date except under extraordinary circumstances. So now you know the major outlines. They're going to concede that if you measure it, it's there. And they're going to argue that it is because of various processes that put it back in after it's already gone. Mesozoic bone consistently yields a falsely young radiocarbon date of a few thousand to a few tens of thousands of years, despite the fact that it is millions of years old. Again, compare that with that first sentence. Science educators need to be aware of the details of these phenomena to be able to advise students whose acceptance of biological evolution has been challenged by young earth creationist arguments that are based on radiocarbon in dinosaur fossils. Now, some of you may be wondering who Philip J. Center is. We're going to see some of his publications. Um, near as I can tell, he's a dinosaur expert. That radiocarbon is not in his usual uh, field of vision, but it's been kind of handed to him because he knows about dinosaur fossils and therefore um, uh, he's going to have to deal with it. Uh, introduction. The recent discovery of radiocarbon in dinosaur fossils has the potential to generate much puzzlement because radiocarbon has a half-life too short for measurable amounts of original radiocarbon to remain in fossils that are millions of years old. Taking advantage of the popularity of dinosaurs, those wicked creationists, the young earth creationist authors now proclaim in an ever-increasing number of books and DVDs and journal articles, but we won't mention those, that radiocarbon in dinosaur fossils demonstrates that the dinosaur fossils must be only thousands, not millions of years old. And uh, I had omitted the references. Uh, Roth is not actually Ariel Roth. That's somebody, some other Roth. Um, and of interest, every single one of those is a book, which means if you are going to try to check out what those people are saying, it's going to be virtually impossible. Uh, many of the other dinosaur-based anti-evolution arguments from young Earth creationist authors are less worrisome because they are plainly absurd. For example, Center 2012-2013A, 2013A, 2017A, 2018, 2019, 
Sieber 2013 center and Wilkins 2013 center and Klein center. That of course is the guy who's writing this article. So he's written a lot about young earth creationist arguments but he really hasn't touched radiocarbon in dinosaur fossils before. Except I think there's a 2019 does have some commentary on it. But the absurdity in the young earth creationist arguments based on radiocarbon is less plain. Make no mistake, it's absurd, but you can't figure it out that easily. So this is a tough nut to crack. Let's see if he cracks it. That is because, continuing the payer graph, students in science education often educators often lack knowledge of the finer details of radiocarbon dating and the fossilization process that show how radiocarbon in dinosaur bones is consistent with an age of millions of years. Appropriate responses to such young earth creationist arguments are therefore not always at hand. Here I present an overview of the relevant details to arm science educators and their students with the information they need to recognize such young earth creationist misinterpretations as incorrect. Now I'm going to stop here and I thought it would be worth our while going back to some of the references that he had and I chose uh, Brian Thomas because number one it was convenient, number two I happen to know Brian Thomas, he's getting his PhD in uh, uh, dinosaur bone and collagen in it. Um, he's from the uh, Institute for Creation Research uh, Dinosaurs in the Bible, Eugene Origin, Harvest House Publishers. This is one of those references. Uh, and there are two passages in that book, in the entire book, that mention it. In the context of the first passage is soft tissue and dinosaur bone, and the context of the second passage is also uh, dinosaur, uh, soft tissue and dinosaur bone with the observation that an egg timer can only keep ticking for less than an hour and so then if you find an egg ticking egg timer you know that the last person in was not uh, three weeks ago or the timer would have run out. Sort of the candle in the cave. Okay <clears throat> And here's the first paragraph, and it's one paragraph that pretty much covers the whole thing. Um, I, in March 2013, I received carbon dates from Montana dinosaur bones. Since then, we have accumulated a couple dozen radiocarbon results from a variety of fossils, including seven different dinosaur species. I did not identify the bones as dinosaurian to the world-class U.S. laboratory that found plenty of radioactive carbon in them. All the carbon-14 in dinosaur bones should have long ago decayed into nitrogen if their evolutionary age assignments are real. Perhaps the reason why dinosaur bones still contain youthful radioactive carbon is because the bones and the rock layers that contain them are thousands, not millions, of years old. So we have two clocks still ticking away inside dinosaur bones, protein decay and radioactive carbon decay. Both show the dinosaurs died off recently. That's the paragraph. And then a chapter or two later, there's a couple of paragraphs uh, where you see circles. That means the paragraph is continuing instead of those stars to begin them. The second egg timer-like line of evidence, the first one being uh, uh, material uh, such as collagen in the, the dinosaur bones, Second egg a timer like line of evidence is radiocarbon that keeps turning up in dinosaurs, other fossils, and carbon containing earth materials. Radiocarbon refers to radioactive carbon atoms. All living things contain at least some radiocarbon. These rare atoms take several thousand years to release their stored energy. Archaeologists use the radiocarbon decay system to establish ages of ancient organic artifacts. But secular paleontologists do not use it to assign dates to dinosaur fossils because they know that carbon dating only works reliably for artifacts that are thousands of years old. They think that trying to carbon date a dinosaur would be a waste of time since dinosaurs died millions of years ago. 
But creationist scientists are not shackled by a belief in millions of years, so we are open to looking for radiocarbon in fossils. My colleagues and I have accumulated over three dozen carbon dates for dinosaurs from various locations, and this adds to dozens of carbon dates published in science journals and magazines for fossils found uh, alongside or beneath a dinosaur remains. One of the bigger collections of those is actually a paper I wrote in 2001 and that Ariel Roth edited. Um, also, secular journals have reported uh, perhaps 800 carbon dates for ancient materials like coal, natural gas, shells, bone, and diamonds. But the radiocarbon egg timer is even shorter than the collagen's timer. It goes ding after only 100,000 years, after which point all the detectable radiocarbon should have spontaneously decayed into stable nitrogen. The comparison is to 900,000 years for collagen to survive, or one million years, essentially. So every time we measure radiocarbon that comes from the fossil itself and not from a contaminant, we are confronted with solid scientific evidence that confirms those dinosaurs, these dinosaurs did not die millions or even hundreds of thousands of years ago, but only tens of thousands or fewer years ago. And uh, it was interesting to see that one reference that is not in his list is the uh, stuff from the Paleo group, um, uh, which this, that reference that you see there is uh, on the internet and people could have checked actual numbers in actual dates that have been given. And the, that story, by the way, has been presented uh, by me a couple of times that are now on YouTube and a few other places in the, uh, um, in the blogosphere. And uh, those references will be available to you after the uh, after this presentation. Uh, to get back to our original article, radiocarbon, radiocarbon dating, and confounding factors. Radiocarbon, this is going to be a quick presentation that he's going to be making. Um, and it's not bad, actually. Uh, it's, uh, Radiocarbon is a radioactive isotope of carbon that decays into nitrogen-14 by emitting beta particles. Radiocarbon forms in the atmosphere after cosmic rays knock neutrons off molecules of atmospheric gases. When nitrogen-14 in the air is exposed to such neutrons, a nucleus of nitrogen-14 captures one of the neutrons and emits a proton, thereby becoming carbon-14. This is all pretty standard. The carbon-14 is incorporated into atmospheric CO2, some of which is absorbed by oceans and lakes, and some of which plants absorb during photosynthesis and animals take in when they eat plant matter. The level of carbon-14 in a plant or animal remains constant until it dies. Well, it actually remains relatively constant, but yeah, close enough. Uh, and therefore, ceases to take in more carbon-14. At death, its carbon-14 level therefore begins to drop. Because of the remaining carbon-14 decays, because the remaining carbon-14 decays at a known rate, it is possible to calculate the date at which a plant or animal died by measuring its remaining carbon-14. Uh, you either have to compare it with an assumed standard or with a known standard. That is the basis of radiocarbon dating. Radiocarbon has a short half-life of only about 5,700 years. So it is only useful for dating materials no older than about 50,000 years. And that's true. Of the radiocarbon that was present in an organism at the time of its death, no measurable amount remains after 100,000 years. That's true. The oldest radiocarbon date in the literature is 85,000 years. And that was on a piece of diamond. Uh, the fossil of an animal that died during the Mesozoic era tens of millions of years ago therefore does not have any measurable amount of its original radiocarbon left. Most science, textbook, science textbooks explain radiocarbon dating in no further detail than that. However, the reality of radiocarbon dating is more complicated. 
There are several factors that can add carbon-14 to samples so that they yield falsely young ages. For example, nuclear fallout, bacterial contamination, and contamination with coal. Um, I think that that's supposed to mean contamination in coal because contamination with coal for most items will give you falsely old ages, but um, and there are other factors that add carbon-14 depleted carbon to samples so that they use falsely old ages. For example, volcanic gases, industrial emissions, and the reservoir effect. And by the way, if they really meant contamination with coal, that would yield a falsely elevated age. However, corrective calibration techniques and other pr procedures can correct for all these confounding factors. Um, well, under certain circumstances, I think. And they do it all is, one of, is very interesting because they weren't able to correct for everything, but um, whatever. Once corrected calibrations and other corrective procedures are implemented, radiocarbon measurements yield correct dates. That's so you don't throw carbon-14 out after you read his article. However, as explained below, Bone mineral is an exception to the rule, and there are no corrective measures that can get fossil bone mineral to generate a correct radiocarbon date. Um, that's debatable, but uh, is not obviously false without further data. Radiocarbon dates from Mesozoic fossils. In two 1990 articles, Young Earth Creationist articles reported carbon-14 analyses of Mesozoic wood and dinosaur bone. The fossil yielded radiocarbon ages between 9,000 and 40,000 years ago. This is the original, or early reports anyway. Since then, Young Earth Creationist authors have submitted several more Mesozoic fossil samples for carbon-14 testing. All have had enough carbon-14 to yield radiocarbon ages between 9,000 and 50,000 years. Uh, that's an interesting spread because most of the ones I've seen have been over 20,000 years. Um, the samples included petrified wood, coal, ammonite shells, and bone from several species of dinosaurs, including the Jurassic genera Allosaurus and Camarasaurus, and the Cretaceous genera Aquacanthosaurus, Edmontosaurus, and Triceratops. And there's a bunch of references, and again, they're not easily available on the internet. Um, and some of them are not available without a little money. Uh, young Earth creationist artic authors consistently claim that the radiocarbon in the fossils demonstrates that the fossils are only a few thousand years old. And again, there's a bunch of references which you're not going to be able to read. However, that is incorrect. Boom. So there. Radiometric dating of mesozoic strata using radioisotopes other than radiocarbon, for example, U-238-206 lead, U-235-207 lead, 87 rubidium, 86 strontium, 40 potassium, 40 argon, 40 argon to 39 argon. Uh, those, those last two are basically the same method, just using a different way of measuring potassium and argon. Shows that the sediments that entomb Mesozoic fossils are 65 to 251 million years old, which means that the fossils that entomb, they entomb are that old, far too old for any measurable amount of original radiocarbon to remain in the fossil. So the radiocarbon simply can't be interpreted straightforwardly, so we're going to have to find another way of explaining it. So how is it that measurable radiocarbon is indeed present in the fossils? Notice, no challenge to the point that it's there. The answer is that although the fossils have lost their original radiocarbon, they have to have, that's obvious, they have since accumulated new radiocarbon that yields a falsely young radiocarbon age. And now the explanation begins. 
bone composition, bone diagenesis and fossilization. Microbial diagenesis. Under some conditions, bacteria then precipitate after death. Mi uh, mineral cement, such as calcite, a form of calcium carbonate, which of course has carbon in it. Pyrite, which doesn't have uh, uh, carbon in it, which I presume is being in included for cr uh, completeness. Siderite, or ferrous carbonate. And kutnohorite, which is a mixture of uh, man manganese and magnesium coupled with calcium carbonate. Basically, the magnesium calcium carbonate is dolomite uh, into those voids. The infilling of voids with minerals is called permineralization and it contributes to fossilization or long-term preservation. Collagen gelatinization, following, again, there's a few more things that are commented there on there. Following the period of microbial activity, the remaining collagen is attacked by abiotic factors that gelatinize the collagen by cutting it into shorter and shorter chains of peptides. That's where you get gelatin, in case you were wondering. Um, uh, and I'm going to skip over bone mineral preservation, permineralization, encrustation, and recrystallization. You can read those in the original. Um, and they're basically, you know, he's saying this stuff comes in from the outside. How new radiocarbon is added to old bone. The amount of carbon-14 in bone drops as the bone loses organic material during the microbial decay phase and the collagen gelatinization phase. However, the amount of carbon-14 in bone then rises again as bone minerals gain new carbon-14. There are five ways that old bone mineral gains new radiocarbon. Recrystallization, permineralization, encrustation, bacterial contamination, and uranium decay. Recrystallization, permineralization, and, in, and encrustation are all kind of put together. Recrystallization brings new radiocarbon into bone mineral when carbonate replaces phosphate. Actually, it also can replace old carbonate in the crystal structure of the bone mineral. The new carbonate contains carbon-14 because it comes from bicarbonate and carbonate in groundwater, which are derived from dissolution of atmospheric carbon dioxide, which contains carbon-14. Bacterial contamination. Old geologic samples can accumulate new radiocarbon through the metabolic activity of recent bacteria and fungi, which take in atmospheric carbon-14. Well, maybe a little. The presence of their cells in their organic waste adds carbon-14 to cold samples. Um, and how much is debated, shall we say? And methane that they excrete adds carbon-14 to petroleum if its temperature is low enough to support live bacteria. And I happen to be familiar with some of those references, especially low, and um, they don't actually establish that. They just say it, it could happen. Uh, coal and petroleum of, often contain enough radiocarbon to yield falsely, well, must be falsely, young radiocarbon ages of a few tens of thousands of years. There is no reason to suppose that recent bacteria and fungi, if present on and in fossil bone, would not add carbon-14 to it, yielding falsely young radiocarbon ages, as with other geologic samples. Say, coal and petroleum obviously have it. Again, no real evidence for that, uh, just uh, it's a possibility. Uranium decay, another way that new carbon-14 is added to geological samples, is via the radioactive decay products of uranium. Radioactive emissions from U-238 add new carbon-14 by converting certain other isotopes, for example, 17 oxygen and 11 boron. The oxygen is apparently a neutron, hits it, a uh, helium nucleus splits off, and you get carbon-14 and 11 boron, a helium 
atom uh, or alpha particle scores a direct hit on the boron and kicks out uh, a neutron and it becomes carbon-14. Or pardon me, it kicks out a proton and it becomes carbon-14. Um, in addition, some of the daughter isotopes of U-238, and here I'm afraid the guy made a mistake. He's not as familiar with his data as he should be. And um, for example, U-223 uh, radi uh, radium. And if I can say that, that's not a data product of U-238. There's uh, 224 radium, which is, I think, also not a daughter product of 238, but 226 radium should be. Uh, if you're trying to figure out how you get, for example, from an odd number to an even number, there's no way to do that if all you're putting out is alpha and beta particles. Um, and. Uh, those, the 223, I think, is coming from uh, uranium-235, for what it's worth. Um, so those daughter isotopes themselves emit carbon-14 nuclei during radioactive decay. It's rare. And the amount has been measured. And it's int of interest that there is no comment as to how much radiocarbon you can expect from this. And there's... Um, probably a reason for it, uh, for that lack of mention. Um, if, given his perspective on what must be happening. Buried bone readily takes up uranium via groundwater and concentrates it, and that's true. So the fossil bone usually has a higher uranium content than the surrounding sediment. Again, numbers are not given. And there's a good reason for that. Well, uh, from his point of view. Implications for radiocarbon dating of recent bone. Collagen. The collagen in bone matrix is the material that use, is u usually used for radiocarbon dating of bone in archaeological samples. And that's true. Um, it's harder to contaminate collagen than it is um, carbonate in bone. Bone collagen can be contaminated by substances in humus and other external sources, which add new carbon-14, yielding f a falsely young radiocarbon age. However, pretreatment removes such contaminants. Pretreated collagen therefore yields a correct age. Unless it is older than 50,000 years, the upper limit for radiocarbon dating. Um, I guess that's because the machine isn't supposed to be able to detect that old. Although, if you read the literature, you find that, uh, in fact, that's not the upper limit. And more importantly, many of the dates that are being get gotten on these bones um, are considerably less than 50,000 years. Um, or you know, in the in the range of one percent of the modern carbon level, which means that you know, all you have to do is get your contaminations down to less than one percent, and the contaminations will not make any difference. Bone mineral, unlike collagen, bone mineral is usually useless for radiocarbon dating, even though the carbonate that bone mineral incorporates during the during life contains carbon-14. The uselessness of bone mineral for radiocarbon dating is due to the fact that bone mineral accumulates new carbon-14 after death, yielding a falsely young radiocarbon age. And that's partly true. There are two exceptions to the rule that bone mineral consistently yields a falsely young age. Cremated bone is an exception because the heat of cremation recrystallizes the bone mineral into a more stable form that is resistant for further recrystallization. The other exception is bone that has been preserved in arid areas that have remained arid for the duration of the bone's presence there. Because infiltration of carbon-14 via groundwater bone minerals doesn't happen where there is no groundwater. 
Now, when I read that, my mind immediately went to the Pisco Formation. Should be interesting. Implications for radiocarbon dating of fossil bone. <clears throat> the fossil bone in Mesozoic samples suffers from problems that make attempts at radiocarbon dating pointless. First, as previously pointed out, radiometric dating of Mesozoic strata using radioisotopes other than radiocarbon shows that Mesozoic fossils are 65 to 251 million years old, far too old for any measurable amount of original radiocarbon to remain. So it can't be there. Just ask yourself, who do you trust? Second, the collagen in Mesozoic bone has usually long since decayed away and is therefore unavailable for radiocarbon dating. That's interesting given Schweitzer's work and others like her, isn't it? Even when original collagen is present, it is millions of years too old to contain measurable amounts of original radiocarbon. But I thought that was the whole question. Third, the processes of recrystallization, permineralization, encrustation, bacterial contamination, and uranium decay, just all of that stuff, add new carbon-14 to old bone, causing it to yield a falsely young radiocarbon age. Maybe, but should it do it to the uh, collagen? Recrystallization, and there's a section on that. All of the fossil bone that young Earth creationist teams have subjected to radiocarbon analysis has include bo included bone mineral. Such samples are therefore useless for obtaining an accurate age by means of radiocarbon. Well, that means that if that statement is inaccurate and they actually submitted collagen to the lab, then that explanation kind of falls apart, doesn't it? Bacterial contamination. The interior of Mesozoic bone does not usually harbor bacteria because most of its organic fraction is usually long since decayed away, uh, Mary Schweitzer notwithstanding, leaving little for bacteria to use for food. Nonetheless, there are some cases in which Mesozoic bone is known to have harbored recent bacteria. Uh, and they give one example, or it's pretty clear that that particular one got infected recently. Uranium decay. Of the nine dinosaur bone specimens that were subjected to radiocarbon analysis in the Young Earth Creation Study by Thomas and Nelson in 2015, which, by the way, I think is a Creation Research Society quarterly, um, the four came from the Hell Creek Formation, which is uranium-rich. Two came from the Lance Formation, which is also uranium-rich. Also, two of the dinosaur genera that previous young Earth creationist teams subjected to radiocarbon analysis, Allosaurus and Camarasaurus, are from the Morrison Formation. The Morrison Formation is uranium-rich, and dinosaur bones from it are notorious for containing large amounts of uranium. How much and how much do you need to do all those transformations that they were talking about? Well, let's not get into the numbers, okay? Um, the dinosaur bone deposit at Ni Dinosaur National Monument, the source of an unidentified dinosaur bone that was also subjected to radiocarbon analysis, and again, that Roth is not our Ariel Roth, um, is also part of the uranium-rich Morrison Formation. As previously noted, carbon-14 is one of the decay products of uranium-238 and some of its daughter isotopes. So see, that takes care of it. No numbers behind that. Implications for radiocarbon dating of fossil wood in shells. Fossil wood. Young Earth creationist teams have reported that Mesozoic petrified, carbonized, and colified wood yielded radiocarbon ages between 11,000 and 50,000 years. Petrified wood. Hmm. Wait a minute. Okay. So if we isolate the... the uh, the cellulose, would that be a good thing to, to test? Petrified wood often contains a substantial fraction of its original organic content, yes, which, but it's not all petrified. 
Sometimes it's what they call subfossil wood. In fact, one of them done by our friend uh, Irvin Taylor, which uh, at first would seem to make it conducive to radiocarbon dating if the young earth creationist position that the wood is only a few thousand years old is correct. Yeah, sounds like a good idea. However, as with fossil bone, petrified wood undergoes recrystallization even millions of years after the death of the organism, often has absorbed a... Imagine having it recrystallized in the last 5,000 years, though. Because remember, if it recrystallized 2 million years, that's all gone, too. often has absorbed a substantial amount of uranium and often contains calcite and other carbonates that were not part of the original tree. Well, could we remove the calcite and date only the cellulose? What if there isn't a lot of calcite? What if there's mostly cellulose? We're reaching here. Because all these factors induce new carbon-14 into such fossils, Attempts to, uh, to determine the ages of petrified wood by using radiocarbon are useless. Yes, uh, Ariel. All these reputable carbon-14 dating laboratories do this. Ask yourself the question, why is this article being written? Okay. It is not being written to try to wrestle with the questions. It is being written to help teachers say, oh, don't worry about this, just read this article and it will take care of it. If you're going to date collagen, you, you remove the other minerals. I sent a sample in for carbon-14 dating once and uh, they were going to date the mineral at first. They thought, no, there's enough collagen, we can do the collagen. So they dissolved all the mineral. There's nothing left but collagen. They couldn't get a good date on it. Well, wait a minute. Why are you removing all the straw from that man? Something needs to be said. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, skip over another paragraph of the same general kind of stuff. Um, ammonite shells. Snelling, 2008, reported that creatious, Cretaceous ammonite shells revealed radiocarbon ages between 36,000 and 49,000 years. Um, However, fossil carbonate shells, like fossil bone and wood, are open systems that accumulate new carbonate, and hence new carbon-14. And it's interesting to ask, how much carbonate would you have to replace? And if that went on for the entire life of the shell, what would be left of a shell that is 40 million years old? But uh, let's not ask those kinds of questions. Uh, via groundwater mediated encrustation and recrystallization. Well, encrustation you should be able to remove. Recrystallization, um, again, how, how, much carb how much shell are you going to have left after you've replaced, uh, let's say, 2% in the last, uh, or 1% in the last um, 5,000 years or so? And then you did that 5,000 years before that, and presumably this process kept on going for the entire, uh, um, entire life of the fossil, or, yes. Yeah. You follow this carefully, you were not to throw out all radiometric dating. Well, I, I'm, I'm glad I'm not having to write his article for him. Um, fossil carbonate shells also readily absorb uranium, which adds new carbon-14 as a decay product. Again, no qualification for this. Um, just, just interesting. Conclusions. Mesozoic dinosaur bones are millions of years old, as demonstrated by radiometric dating with radioisotopes other than carbon-14. Radiocarbon in mesozoic dinosaur bones is new, not original to the bone. Its addition to the bones yields the false appearance of young age. The new radiocarbon and fossil bone mi mineral is in carbonate that is incorporated into the crystal structure of the bone mineral during recrystallization and cannot be removed by pre-treatment. 
in some cases, bacterial activity or the radioactive decay products of uranium add even more radioactive radiocarbon to the bone. That's the conclusion. And further comments. Teachers who encounter students who have been misled by young earth creationist arguments are based on radiocarbon in dinosaur bones are encouraged to direct such students to the information presented here. This is your useful reference if you're a teacher. However, young earth uh, creationist publications have generated a plethora of other anti-evolution arguments and it would be useful to be able to counter the, those as well. It is therefore worthwhile to note that there are four recent books that together refute nearly all of the young earth creationist arguments that have been published so far. Isaac in 2007, Prothera 2007, Cain et al. 2016, and Center, that's my work, in 2019. Skipping over a minimal sentence. Additionally, for students who profess loyalty to the Bible, it would be useful to know that several passages in the Old and New Testament instruct a, wait a minute, what is this doing in carbon-14 in dinosaur bones? It would be useful to know that several passages in the Old and New Testament instruct against taking Genesis literally, and therefore that the Bible itself does not support the young earth creationist view. Could have fooled me. Um, such passages are reviewed in Center 2019 and are partially reviewed in Center 2016. And one of those is online, I think Center 2016, and uh, is interesting to read. Uh, the, uh, uh, the biblical work is quite remarkable, particularly for somebody who is a geologist by training. It would be worthwhile for teachers to know of such resources as, so as to direct students to them when appropriate. Now you're going, wait a minute, you can't, you, you can't do that. It is legal, at least in the United States, to address religious concerns that students bring up in science classes, as long as the teacher does not endorse one religious view over another. I guess, um, Conservative Christianity doesn't count as a religious view. What about well, uh, parse that one the way you want to. Um, studies on conceptual change suggest that addressing such concerns may be effective in helping feel students feel comfortable accepting evolution and an old earth if their objections to such concepts are based on religious concerns. I thought we just said that you don't endorse one religious view over another. Um, we have a comment here. We'll just, um, if we can bring the mic down. Uh, no. I too read this article very, very carefully. And in the end. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. You read this article very carefully. I read it very carefully. Uh, I got the article from a friend, read it carefully, and then passed it on to several other. It's on the internet now, so that's why I Good. feel very comfortable. Good. In, I, and uh, I would say it's very, very clear to me that the author comes up with a single argument, period. And that is, we know the old dates are true, so the young dates cannot be true without any further investigation, don't bother. So basically, and that is that is really strong science. We we throw in the kitchen sink in our arguments because you know it's not true. So pick your I mean, way of ignoring it. The things he brings up that he's trying to infer, ups, up, make trying to determine the radiocarbon age ridiculous, are simply like. You have water you've let clarify, and then you go in and you stir up the mud that just settled out. You can't see anything and say, therefore, it's purposeless to look at the clear water. Uh, yes. It's just, and if that's as good as it gets, I hope there are enough clear thinking high school teachers to see through it and at least point out that this argument doesn't take it anywhere. 
Such help could be a useful supplement to science-based refutations of young Earth creationist arguments such as those presented here regarding radiocarbon in dinosaur bones. And that's the end of that part. He presents uh, all of the mineral-based uh, radioactive ages as unassailable. Clear, obvious, without pointing out anything in parallel. Well, I'll make a few comments and then we'll open it up formally. Well, I'm, uh, I'm sorry to butt it in. No, it's I okay. Have, have it's okay. Yeah, this is a landmark article. It admits that if one dates dinosaur bone, one gets a finite, much younger than standard geological expectations, age for dinosaur bone. That's just a fact, and nobody's arguing with that anymore. Well, I, there may be some people out there who do. If they do, throw them this article. It tries to discredit the age by arguing for various forms of contamination. It does not deal with ages on collagen at all. If anything, it says they don't exist. Its treatment of wood is especially superficial. If you isolate out the, the uh, uh, cellulose in wood, you should have the same argument as a collagen in dinosaur bone. The arguments for nuclear production of carbon-14 are particularly superficial. No numbers, no idea of what quantity it would take. And other people have done that, and it doesn't work as well. There is no attempt to quantify the arguments. Uh, their attempts by others to quantify the arguments have shown them to be inadequate. Maybe we should go into that sometime. Bone dates largely match collagen dates. Even the arguments against bone dates may not be accurate in the end. In other words, he's made a good stir the mud up argument. What he has not done is said, and here is this bone that got in trouble, and here is that bone, and which bones actually don't date well. And one could compare bone mineral dates with collagen dates and see how accurate they actually are. When that's done with dinosaur bones, it actually comes out pretty even, which means that the arguments need to work on collagen, and his don't. Center assumes that cold dates have been proven to be inaccurate, which actually isn't true. What has been shown is that there is carbon-14 in coal. This carbon-14 shouldn't be there given the standard geologic time scale. And if you are a standard geologist, you have to write this off as contamination. If one does not start out with the assumption that the standard geologic time scale is correct, the obvious conclusion is that carbon-14 into old materials, including dinosaur bone, including coal, including wood, suggests that it is not that old. Center, interestingly enough, is not a specialist in radiocarbon dating. He is a special, uh, why they didn't get somebody like that, I don't know. Uh, he is a specialist in dinosaurs. I don't think this article is the final answer. You probably have figured that out by now. But I do have to say that it is encouraging to see that the problem is getting serious attention. That's how I think this is the landmark article. It actually concedes the major point. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Ariel. Uh, first of all, do we know of any bacteria that produce collagen? Um, no. Um, I rest my case. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I can't argue. <clears throat> Secondly, I would point out there are probably only one or two uh, samples of carbon that have been dated that don't have some carbon-14 in them. I mean, it, it's, no, everywhere they look, they've got, they find that carbon-14. Uh, this tells you that this is a, a serious problem. You can put up all the excuses you want to. If you check everything, there's carbon-14 is still there. Well, actually, uh, the, the limitations of the method are that 
uh, with very careful work, one can get down to 0.005% modern carbon. Uh, that work was done by Taylor and uh, Southon um, on diamonds. And but I am willing to say that if somebody wants to argue that that is contamination, it's probably true. We do know that some labs are not that good at removing contamination because they have taken material, given it a date, run it through their process, and redated it, and the amount has gone up. However, there, uh, you know, that suggests that you're adding radiocarbon from the atmosphere somehow or from something into your sample by, by, the, by the process. And I think that we do a disservice to people to say that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. However, there is one particular laboratory that was able to run old samples through their process and got for statistical purposes, the exact same date, down to about 0.04% uh, modern carbon, suggesting that at least in careful laboratories that is possible. Um, in fact, their amount of carbon, radiocarbon went down slightly, but not statistically significantly. So you know, you, you'd have to say it. it it's probably adding very, very close to nothing. So it can be done, and the fact that we can do it that well suggests that if you're very careful, you should be able to get those dates down to in the neighborhood of 0.04% modern carbon. And the fact that they're not does kind of suggest that maybe they aren't that old. Um, the only thing that's left is stuff m being made by uranium. And uh, maybe one of these days we'll go over that c source of contamination and how much it theoretically should add. And it turns out to be extremely low and not measurable and therefore will not account for the dates that are being gotten. Mm, this kind of arguments reminds me of a case where somebody got bit by a dog and then sued the owner and the owner's defense was um, dog never bit him and if the dog did bite him uh, it wasn't his dog that bit him, and at the end, uh, it couldn't have been his dog because I don't even have a dog. You know, it, it's it, it's it's kind of like a perpetual regression um, of arguments. First of all, this is argued. We know this is old enough uh, so that there couldn't be any radiocarbon there, and therefore. If there is any, it has to be from somewhere else. But if you are uh, still seeing some after having accounted it for somewhere else, then it must be some additional contamination or some, some fraud or what have you. I note with the arguments themselves that there is a problem here. If they're going to argue that radiocarbon dating is fallacious or unreliable, then how the Dickens do they, with such great confidence, claim that all the other radioisotope determinations are so pristine, when at the same time, in order to undermine radiocarbon dating, they're talking about all this uranium coming in and going out and whatnot, and conversion and degradation and what have you. How is it that, that these long-lived radioisotopes are not subject to the same reflection? Do they not come and go similarly? 
or wh what's going on? They're, they're excellent measures only if they happen to agree with what we want them to say, but the moment we get an answer that is different from what we expect, then there must be some kind of uh, 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 hocus pocus going on. And the arguments about bacterial infections or infestations or, uh, or colonizations or whatever you want to call it, bacteria are not stupid. They don't go to places where they have nothing to live on. The fact that bacteria, modern bacteria supposedly, are in bone that is supposed to be 60 million years old tells you immediately, this is like a bioassay. It tells you there is something of the original material of value to an organism there. Whether we are able to detect it or not, the bacteria are your canary in the coal mine. They tell you it's there. Yeah. So for them to turn around and argue against this, using bacteria as a justification, is like, a, uh, it's like a crook who's trying to prove that they're innocent of, 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 of robbing a bank because they were busy r killing somebody. Th does this make sense to you? Uh, I'm looking at this kind of thinking and I wonder, how, how is it that, I mean, these people must be bright enough. Why would they come up with such flimsy arguments that anybody can see right through. Do they really think that everybody else is so naive and superficial that they can't entertain a, a, a logical train of thought? Well, there's, there's a couple of things that can be said. Okay, one of them is there is logic and then there is what could be called pseudo-logic. And pseudo-logic is kind of like the dog. Uh, or another illustration is the guy who claims that I, I am not responsible for your broken vase. First of all, I never borrowed it. Secondly, when I borrowed it, it was already broken. Thirdly, when I returned it to you, it was intact. Now, if you think about it, those are three mutually exclusive scenarios. Um, neither one can be true, or whatever the plural of neither is, if the other is true. But the point of all of them is to say, I'm not responsible. See? And so, Logic is not actually being used here. It's, uh, it's more of, I need to get to this end, so I will use any argument that will work. Um, and, and that tells you that somebody is more after winning than that person is after the truth. Um, and in fact, there is a a kind of argument that is specifically intended not to find the truth, but to comfort people who are wanting to be told everything is fine. And I'll give you another example from another area. Uh, at one point I was discussing um, online with some people uh, about the Black Sea Flood. And they were throwing around stuff like, well, maybe, you know, uh, there was an island and the black, the water started coming up and, and left, or, or there was a, uh, a, uh, a hill and the water came up and turned it into an island and then there's no way of escaping from the waters but by getting on a boat, okay? And then as the water just kept coming up and up and up, why, uh, uh, then that's the way the story of the flood went. So I pressed the guy and well, how many details do you believe and how many details do you not? 
was Noah building the boat for 120 years? Well, no, probably not. Um, well, were there any animals on the ark? Yeah, but probably not as many as there are now. And so basically, I tried to collect their story uh, as best they could tell it. And then I simply turned around and tried to put all of this information into a story that would substitute for the flood story and be more accurate. Right. And after making that story, and basically incorporating everything they said, and this part's a little exaggeration, but this part is pretty accurate, you know, and there was a flood and it would float it up. I, I said, no, what would be really interesting is to assume that you're right. Yes, that's right. And that means that the, that the hills were covered to 15 cubits. So what we should look for is somewhere where there's a there's a mound about 22 and a half feet below the surface of the Black Sea. And uh, see if we can find an ancient civilization that's been drowned on it. And at this point, the guy became very uncomfortable. Because you see, the story wasn't intended to be taken as truth. <laughs> it was just a it was intended to calm people who wanted to believe that there was a flood, but really couldn't buy a worldwide flood as described, the, the way the Bible would be written, uh, read kind of naturally. And uh, so that they could feel them to themselves that they were believing this, but, but not in any testable way. The moment it's testable, it's a problem. That's right. The, the moment it's testable, it's a problem. And, and, and so this guy, he's throwing in, well, maybe it's coming from uranium. No numbers. How many percent uranium does it take? You know, how much of this? People have done that. Well, you could measure the um, uranium in the place. Well, you could measure the uranium in the bones. Uh, in fact, uh, my suggestion is that anybody who does more of this work should just because measure the uranium in this particular bone and, and, um, and where it is and, and, and measure the boron. Uh, and I mean, I know it's a pain in the neck and it's going to add to the expense, but you know, um, if people are going to do this kind of you know, hand waving stuff, then you need to have numbers so that you can say, well, in this particular bone, that works well. Or, more likely, in this particular bone, that doesn't work at all. Because you're like three orders of magnitude too low. Or, uh, in the case of uranium, probably six orders of magnitude too low. Because people have done calculations on this. And there isn't much there. Uh, I mean, 1% uranium is pretty high in bone. 1%? Um, and it's, and it's, worth, it's worth mentioning those things. And we need to be doing that kind of analysis because we need to be able to show that when people make these kinds of arguments, they haven't run the numbers. And if you run the numbers, it doesn't work. Um, which is going to be a pain in the neck. But I think it's the only right way to do it. Rather than me saying, oh, there isn't enough uranium, you need to start asking, well, how much uranium would it take in concert with how much boron, how much, and so forth. Right. And that's what really needs to happen in this situation. Um, I have a feeling that the numbers aren't going to come out the way he wants. And I also have a feeling that he's deliberately elided the fact that a number of groups have done collagen dates. And all of this hand-waving on what bone has falls apart if you do the collagen date. Because the contamination is of 
of carbonate is not a problem with collagen. And he knows it, and in fact, if you'll notice, on the way through, he said collagen dates are good. And they do correct for all these problems that he's been throwing stuff around on. But he never bothered to mention them. I didn't bother to mention them. Well, because you see, this article is not intended to, to find truth. This article is intended to comfort people who are being bombarded by evidence that they have no way of gainsaying. Uh, it's okay. It, it'll work. He, he, uh, he just has to turn it on. Try it again. Did it go dead? Okay, I'm going to deviate from the science because I'm not a scientist. Um, but I'm very curious which chapter and verse tells us not to believe the Genesis account. <laughs> I mean, I've been reading the Bible. I read it every year, and it says over and over and over, I created it in six days. I, I don't recall any Well, uh, okay. Did he give uh, some? I will, I will remind you of two things. Number one, he's not actually a trained theologian. But number two is that um, he does actually have this stuff out, and at least some of it is on the web, and you can read it. And I read it, and uh, let's say, as a person who actually does have a degree in theology, um, or biblical studies, actually, um, I was not terribly impressed. Okay. Why don't you write a little um, letter to the editor where that was published? Well, it's four years ago. It, it's, uh, it's a little out of date by now, so, yeah. I wanted to know the same thing, too. Okay, uh, no, uh, um, I'll, I'll tell you what, since I can do this, I will, I've got to send out the, the letter anyway, because uh, uh, Jeff needs it for, uh, for uh, when it goes on the internet. Um, but uh, in addition to all of the other references, I'll pull out one and maybe both. I'll have to look to see whether the newer reference is on the internet itself. Uh, and, then, uh, and then you can read it for yourself. I guess this is where, yeah, it's working. I, I really wonder if uh, he hasn't destroyed his own argument. Uh, uh, anybody reading this article carefully, you know, uh, I have to say, man, there's nothing to carbon-14 dating. Uh, how come everything else is correct? Well, okay, there's, there's a couple of things. One of them is he hasn't actually destroyed his argument. He has completely, he has admitted that if you get collagen dates in, in bone, you're good. Which means that if we have collagen dates in dinosaur bone, we're good. And he just, he didn't realize that he just stepped in it right there. We created a verifiable tsunami. That's right, that's right. But he, he, he suggests bacteria contaminate the stuff. Bacteria contaminate this stuff. Uh, okay, it's interesting how bacteria contaminate it without leaving any bodies while the, well, the things that look for all the world like osteocytes and don't have obvious bacterial contamination in them are not original. The bacteria come in and they take the form of the osteocytes, I think, and that the, that the, uh, uh, the, uh, of course, that would raise the question, wouldn't you expect the osteocytes to um, uh, then have, instead of the standard osteocyte cell walls, to have 
little bacteria uh, along their cell walls. Somebody should do some electron microscope uh, uh, work on these. Uh, I think that uh, it would be remarkable if one could show that those cell walls weren't really cell walls, that they were actually bacterial layers. <laughs> Uh, again, ask the question, because I think there will be other articles in that same group that will talk about the soft tissues, because that's a problem for them. Um, it, it, that's why I say I, I don't think we should finish by just discussing the radiocarbon. I think that the other material also needs to be discussed. Let's see if this, it works. I think this gentleman uh, is uh, realizing that there's a problem that's gaining momentum. And he's coming up with everything he can, totally ignoring uh, stuff. But most of the people are superficial, so they're not going to go into, including the two million or how many million teachers in this country. So he perceives that there's a problem that's brewing. I think the best thing for him to do is to politicize it, and he's going to get tremendous traction. <laughs> I'm just kidding on that one. <laughs> but would you, would you make a, would you make a presentation sometimes on collagen dating? Um, collagen dating? Yeah. Um, I, I suppose that one could. Would be, I think yeah. that would be good. Yeah, uh, to just to just give the data so it's out there. Right, right. And I, I think he has done something that's very, very sophisticated. I'm not sure he intended to do it that way, but uh, what you do is you quote your opponents, but you quote them in such a way that you don't give any of their data, that you leave their arguments kind of vague, and that you quote, only sources that you can get by sending money to ICR. So what most people will do at that point, especially kids that are 10 years old and get, you know, a dollar a week allowance maybe, um, is they, they say, well, I can't get that one, I can't get that one. And he never cites anything that the kids can actually look up to see what the original was. Which is why I gave a few things that you can look up that have actual data in them. And I think that this is, I think one of the things we're going to have to get used to in terms of evangelism is putting things online so that everybody can get them and not trying to put a paywall up. Because um, uh, paywalls are nice for p enriching people, but they're not good for spreading information. And the cure for this kind of an article is getting the actual data out there. And one can see that he is ignoring the collagen dates. Of course, that's one of the functions of what we're doing right now. I'm presenting stuff there, and eventually uh, we'll come back and we'll pull out, down some actual data from various places. And uh, in fact, the, the other thing that he did, interestingly enough, is he never cited, I mean, the, the, the book that, that I read, anyway, didn't actually have numbers in those dates. So if you read that, you go, well, that just says we did the dates and we got some uh, we got some numbers and we don't know what the numbers are and we don't know what the dates are, um, you know. Um, I don't know whether we're going to get online the uh, PhD thesis of uh, Brian Thomas, but there are numbers that go with them, and some of them are college and dates because that's what Brian's specialty is soon to be if he's not already Dr. Thomas. Um, and uh, um, 
and he does have numbers to back that up. But you'd never get those numbers from this guy. If you tried to research it, he gives you the worst place to go and hunt for young earth creationist research. Service its purpose. And which is one of the reasons why when I have the ability to, I actually cite numbers, dates. Uh, this one went to the University of Georgia or whatever and be able to say, look, here are the hard numbers. Now, you can put them together any way you want to. This is how I put them together, but you know, uh, you do it your way. Uh, and I think that's far more appropriate than what this guy has done, which is, kind of, oh, there's a bunch of mud over there, <laughs> and uh, you know it can't be right, so don't even bother going there. At least that's how I read the approach. Yeah, I, I think the article suffers from a little bit of too much self-referential. Uh, he quotes himself too much. Well, especially when he's not a researcher in the area. Yes, it's, uh, it's very weak in that area. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> um, uh, I'll try to do better in getting a... a an email out this week and maybe you can come more prepared. <laughs>